know the Women's Center on Columbia? They're open right now, they do showers. I just have a few questions about uh, the process of uh, getting into detox. I got myself a benzo test kit. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. So that way, this, the problem that happened last time won't happen this time. They told me it's either sober up or die. I'm really reliable, and I know that I'm going to make a good employee once once all of my health issues are worked on, so. This isn't who you are, Tim. We don't do alcohol withdrawal. Okay. And we also don't do benzodiazepines. Okay. How are you feeling now that you, you just got a date set? Mm, hopeful. Hello, Access. Hello, my name is Timothy Gray. I was wondering uh, what the waiting list is for um, getting accepted or getting in there to detox. I'm uh, currently I'm a fentanyl user. It's not just him getting into detox. It's also everything that happens in between that first call and him walking through the door. Like I know they made it in the '40s. Um, that. Um, chemist or whatever he was playing around with codeine and he better delivery methods and he stumbled across fentanyl. Fentanyl. A synthetic opioid 50 times stronger than heroin. Its intended use was for pain relief. The toxic drug is often mixed with heroin, methamphetamine, and alcohol and at the heart of Canada's drug crisis is pain. Nearly 10,000 British Columbians have died since it was first declared a public health emergency in 2016. It's really heartbreaking down here. People in their addictions, they don't have any control over it. The coastal city of Vancouver harbors a troubled neighborhood. The downtown east side a place many call home. This is where I used to come to hang out with my buddies. Um, they probably don't really want to say hi this morning. He's putting his middle fingers up, so. But I think part of me was trying to probably kill childhood trauma. It used to be a fun place in its time. I used to rip up the dance floor by myself. <laughs> like the Dean of Electrical at BCIT said that was the best view they had in forever, a long time, and um, they couldn't wait for me to come back. And, uh, you know, I was nominated for Lieutenant Governor's Award for Academic Excellence, you know. He was such a good baby. Like, he was just, he only cried if he was hungry or wet. He has a big personality. He's uh, got a kind, generous heart. He's very intelligent. He can fix almost anything. He's a handyman for sure. Very resourceful. Anne Marie Sexton was just 16 years old when her son Tim was born. Yeah, there's just something about being in nature that's really helpful. Yeah. As a single mom, she moved her young family to Vancouver in 1984. 
she says Tim was a charming young boy, but fell in with the wrong crowd. You're at that age trying to figure out who you are. Yeah, you're influenced so much by your peers, trying to fit in. Do you want to sit down, Tim? Do you want to put that up on the sh on the bed here and sit for a minute? No? Yeah. Um, yeah. Then when I found out that it was uh, crack, he was probably about 16 years old. There were no youth programs for anyone his age, so he ended up in a recovery program with adults. She says the realities of substance use are painful to imagine. You know, reading things in the paper about someone dying, and I haven't heard from him for a month or whatever, and, and uh, I'm looking for indications of whether it's Tim. I was uh, trying to buy some drugs. I was trying to get a half ounce of down through one of the mechanics I've known for a long time. I'm going to meet this guy. So it's been half ounce. Turns out to be laced heavily with PCP. And uh, I should have died. She says creating clear boundaries has helped her support her son's recovery efforts. That was hard as a parent to have to say, well, I'm sorry, but you, you know, you can't, you can't be here right now because you're, you're active in your addiction. And that uh, is heartbreaking. Tim Gray has spent the majority of his life navigating the cycles of addiction in the downtown east side. And in 2009, he got clean. Started his second year, but then was in a car accident, and uh, they gave him opioids in the hospital, and that started his addiction all over again. He hasn't been clean since. But now he says he is ready to try again, and his mother is beyond hopeful. I just have a few questions about uh, the process of uh, getting into detox. Uh, they'll call in and they'll be assessed. We don't do alcohol withdrawal. Okay. And we also don't do benzodiazepines. Okay. And so with the uh, benzos being in the street drugs these days, how does that affect a person's ability to get into detox? All right. So it, it's become a huge issue. Yeah. See, a lot of times clients don't don't realize they've been doing benzos. It is creating a, an unforeseeable barrier for these people that are trying to get into detox, trying to get clean. The chief coroner of British Columbia says the province is seeing record-breaking numbers of overdose deaths. And the total number of toxic drug deaths rose by 26% in 2021, totaling six deaths a day. The arrival of illicit fentanyl is really the game changer. It's so challenging for people to manage their drug use when they don't know what's in the drugs that they're buying. According to the report, traces of fentanyl were detected in 85% of all toxic drug deaths from 2017 to 2021. And she has a number of recommendations. They have to treat that supply as potentially lethal. Drug testing needs to be um, more widely available. And then, of course, on a bigger level, what we're really wanting to see is safer supplies, better treatment and recovery options for people that are evidence-based, that are accessible for people where they need them, and then decrim, decriminalizing so that we recognize that drug use is not, these are not criminals. According to a report released by Vancouver Grassroots Organizations, illicit alcohol was present in 29% of all illicit drug deaths in BC between 2018 and 2020. Sandra Stewart helped table the report. She 
she's been sober for nearly three years, and she says more needs to be done about illicit alcohol use. And it's kind of dead end where I was living at in Haida Gwaii. Um, no jobs, and even when there's jobs, it was pick and choose, whatever. So I ended up coming da back down here to further my education. I wanted to work. Good morning. You guys want some Timbits? Please. Okay, here you go. At the time I moved down here, I was full into my alcoholism. Yeah, you should have got more <laughs> here. <laughs> There you go. You're welcome. I used to hang out on what we call the block or four corners. Sit there with my buddies, drinking up a storm. Nothing mattered, like not even my kids. But it's not that I didn't care about them. It just uh, was so heavy into that. Pretty hard life down here. Regardless of the hard life, there's a lot of cheerful people down here. All helping each other out. See, this is the neighborhood that loves people. Yeah. And we love yeah. them too, yeah. We love all these people. This is the neighborhood that has respect for other people. Of course. Uh, to be told, I did get into the illicit alcohol. The East Side Illicit Drinkers Group for Education defines illicit alcohol as not meant for human consumption, illegally produced alcohol, and store-bought alcohol used in an illegal way. And for Sandra, she believes illicit alcohol is responsible for her liver failure. They told me it's either sober up or die, and you you need a liver transplant. You know the Women's Center on Columbia? They're open right now, they do showers. Uh, that's just, uh, Columbia is just down here. I'm really reliable, and I know that I'm gonna make a good employee once once all of my health issues are worked on, so just want to be able to help people. We're trying to change it for them. We're trying to change it for the people that live down here. We're not coming down here to judge them. Yep, they're human beings, so that's how I look at them. Last year, Anne-Marie's younger son, Chad, passed away from a toxic drug overdose. He was super sweet. And he was, uh, anything he tried, he would pick it up the first time. <laughs> it just made everybody so jealous of him, you know, because he could, he could do anything. Got a call from my son saying that they had been up uh, at our campsite and that Chad was uh, using um, heroin. And I was j just horrified. You know, like you just can't breathe. Chad passed away in July last year. It's something the family never saw coming. And for Anne-Marie, it's all the more reason to keep advocating for Tim's recovery. I know I'm definitely a lot more concerned about Tim now. I think he's aware of it too, though, that I'm like, I gotta check in on him yeah. often. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's always hard to see where he is, but it's just a relief to see him. When I have those moments with him where he's fully present, that's when I try to hang on to him as long as possible. You know, like, let's just hang out for a few minutes so we can, you know, kind of connect and see see where you're at, you know? Like, are you ready for detox yet? Or are you thinking about it? H Hello? Uh, like, I don't, I can't, you guys can't come here for another an hour, at least. At least? Uh, well, yeah, are you sure you want to give me a heads up, man? Asking if you do the interview in my place is something that you should have asked me yesterday. No, don't worry, Tim. Don't panic. We can go yeah. for lunch or something. It's okay. Sounds good. Okay. 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 Love you. Just having anxiety. I'm trying to get everything cleaned up. 
She says the stress of detoxing is beginning to weigh on him. The timing, I just finished cleaning my room. I was just about to hop in the shower. So, okay. I'm All right. Sorry, man, but yeah, it's, 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 it's good. It's actually. Yeah. Okay. That's Thank you for giving me the time. All right. Okay. We'll see you soon then. Yeah, I'll call you. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. We're going to sleep. I got myself a benzo test yet. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Where we this the problem that happened last time won't happen this time. So, but anyway, you're testing your supply for benzos, so you should be good to go. Anything else? Uh, crystal meth, yeah. Hey, how much of each are you using? Well, I use about a point of heroin a day, and probably like um, I don't know, three quarters of a pound of crystal meth. I'm just kidding. Three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a, that's a little bit of that's a mostly ratio, yeah. So the next booking is March 25th. And what day is it today? Friday? Yeah, so the next booking is March 25th. Yeah, so I'm going to be going to Vegas for the next couple of days. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So I can. Yeah. It's the only thing you can do is like joke about it because it's so funny. like so many people have, have lost like so many friends that have died and uh you know and it's just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mom, and then you know when i first relapsed or whatever right like i i had been clean for how many years i was Dating the, pretty much, yeah, somebody that I considered to be the love of my life. Uh, she was gonna be, she ended up being pregnant with my soon to be son. I was in my 30s, right? I waited till I was in my 30s before I had a kid, right? I wanted to have a son. I was working, doing well with that. I remember arguing with my brother Chad that passed away. He was like, you know, you don't even love them enough to stop. And it's like, you don't. You don't get it, Chad. It's like, uh, I mean, maybe the, I had the decision the day when I relapsed. I was like, but I'm way beyond that now. So how are you feeling now that you've, you've just got a date set? <sighs> Hopeful. Hopeful. of this uh, relapse and just knowing and sort of reliving how much he suffered over the last 10 years and uh, and the days leading up to going into and all the, having all the ducks in a row and having everything just set up so that uh, there's no looking back. You know, Tim is set to go to detox in one week. And so he would not be able to... People that have addiction issues, a lot of them have lost their connections to their families and, and uh, their families have given up and they, they just don't know how to help or the, that boundary has been crossed way too many times or they have been exploited and they've had enough or just whatever the case is. Okay. I 
go, well, I might, if they accept me right now today, then I go upstairs or whatever, and they go through all my stuff and uh, take me in or whatever. We'll see. feel like uh, we give them a little bit of our strength and we call them back to life you know we remind them of who they are this isn't who you are Tim you know you are so much more don't forget that. Come back to us. All we can do is hope that it'll ignite that flame and it'll bring them back. And they'll come back to us and they'll try one more time. I need to just let go and let God in me. Yeah. And uh, just trust that, you know, He's in His hands. Entering detox, Tim went into precipitated withdrawal. Precipitated withdrawal is a condition where the body experiences unusually sudden and severe withdrawal symptoms. It can sometimes happen in response to medically assisted treatments for opioid addiction. Tim left detox two days after being admitted. On average, it takes five attempts before someone is successful in their recovery. Tim remains hopeful. He says this won't be the last time he tries to enter recovery. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, contact Wellness Together Canada at 1-866-585-0445. Our belongings don't belong in a museum, but the, right now the museum has um, a lot of our history there. And while we're still here, I think we should all be going after them and getting them back to our people. And when they are sacred, they belong to the people, um, not to the museum.